Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another program in our series, Living on Long Island. We will continue a discussion that we recently had concerning the elderly on Long Island and their problems with poverty and hunger. It is my pleasure to have two guests who will enlighten the audience about this very serious problem. They are Christine Deska, Associate State Director, AARP. Thanks Christine, for a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Joe. You're welcome. And Gwen O'Shea, President and CEO of the Health and Welfare Council of Long Island. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Okay, in a previous show, we talked about this issue of poverty and hunger. Just let's reflect and review about this, the seriousness of the problem on our island. Sure. Well, I think a lot of people just don't realize what a big issue older adult hunger is. Oftentimes in the news, we hear about childhood hunger, and, and those numbers are also very shocking to know that one in five children are struggling but also nine million people 50 and over are struggling with food insecurity as we call it. But really that just means they don't know where their next meal is coming from. They're not sure they can afford to put nutritious food on the table in order to keep nine themselves. Nine million where? Nine million people 50 and over throughout our country, nine million Americans. And it's probably more. And it's probably more. And here on Long Island, we're looking at over 50,000 older adults that are likely to be eligible and not accessing uh, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, the SNAP program, that could be helping them put nutritious foods on the table for themselves and their families. When? Christine brings up you know, some really staggering numbers that I think for many of the viewers and, and many individuals, even on Long Island, don't recognize that there are so many of our community members, in particular the senior population, that is struggling in covering their basic needs. And these are individuals that primarily have worked their whole life have been able to cover their basic costs, potentially raise their families here, and now are at a point in time that they've really never been at before where they can't do that any longer. That they are sacrificing other basic needs like medication or having the heat on because the cost of living has just changed so dramatically that it makes it virtually impossible for them to access all the things they need to access to be healthy. And as Christine pointed out, there are many individuals that are eligible but not receiving the benefit, which is a real challenge because there is support so that individuals don't have to struggle in the way that they're currently struggling. So if, if I'm going to the train, or my uh, or viewers going to the train and they see someone come up to me, I've had it, uh, I'm hungry, I need m money for this. This is not, this could be a fact. Well, Absolutely. Yeah, there could be programs that individual may not be aware of or may not know where to go to to find out about. Um, and there are a lot of, I think, places Gwen and I would point that person to to make sure that they do get fully assessed to see what benefits they might be eligible for and, and don't know about and may not be receiving. Okay, so I think we've, I think we've made the case that elderly hunger as a sublet of elderly poverty does exist on Long Island. Absolutely. Okay. So now what programs have helped to alleviate it? So when we look at poverty overall from a historical perspective, there are a number of programs that have helped to mitigate and prevent it from growing dramatically. Those are programs like the Medicare program, Social Security, Medicaid, and the SNAP program, which is formerly known as food stamps. And why did they change that? Do, uh... They changed the name, and actually AARP was one of the leaders at the national level. We as a local organization worked with AARP and other individuals to really push for that change because of the stigma piece. Individuals hear food stamps, and they think you're going to be handed stamps, and you have to go into the supermarket, and there's, you know, from a pride perspective and, and from a, a humanistic perspective, the, the tone that it's carried has been negative for so long. So this name makes it perhaps more attractive to individuals when you talk about supplementing your nutrition uh, with this benefit that now comes through a ATM-like card so that there's privacy related to using um, the benefits. So um, who, who decides on how much SNAP is done each year? Is that Congress? 
It is so. Is that, it's renewed each year with a different level. So or? the SNAP program is a federal program right. that does have states do have the ability to enhance the eligibility levels depending on what determination was made at the federal level. And New York State really has done a fantastic job recognizing the growth of poverty, not just amongst our seniors, but amongst all of our populations, working families, families with children, minority communities, and has said we need to enhance that benefit. So New York um, did enhance the benefit for a period of time, um, and we, that's one of the things that we both, AARP and Health and Welfare Council, uh, collectively work on is an expansion of that benefit rate. All right, so you, 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 what your organization doing, you're doing it throughout New York State to enhance that benefit. Yes. You don't go to the federal government and say you have to increase that benefit. You don't do that. Well, AARP advocates on both the national and the state level and the local level. So if um, they cut it or keep it the same and you feel it's more, you'll go back to the state and say you have to do more. So yes. both, and in effect, yes. both levels have to do more. Both levels, and, and both. it is the, the hub. Be everybody. Of, that's right. The hub is at, at the federal level. And so while we're not a national organization as AARP is, we do work very closely with our uh, senators and our congressional representatives when the farm bill comes up uh, or when any nutritional programs come up and there's a proposal, which unfortunately seems to be the case every time it comes up for reauthorization, that there's a proposed cut. And we recognize what that means to Long Islanders, our seniors, because they're growing dramatically from an age category perspective, and what it means for our local economy. So we, we do work together at every different level, like Christine said, the integration and the partnership between local government, state government, and federal to make sure we have those safety net programs and that they are adequate for the needs is critical. Uh, what is AARP's recommendations to ease hunger and po uh, poverty on Long Island? What do they, what do they like to see done beside the SNAP program? Sure. So AARP, when we first started working on this issue, was, which was just in 2010, what we did was gather stakeholders across New York, leaders in the field like Gwen and many others, and brought folks together for a summit up in Albany and then one in New York City to really kind of get the best thinking on what can be done to combat older adult hunger. And it was actually the first time it had ever happened to combine hunger and aging. So that just really speaks to the fact that this is still very much a newer issue for people to kind of shift their attention to. Um, so some of the recommendations that AARP has put forth in our most recent recommendations paper are mainly focused on this gap that exists with people who are likely eligible and not receiving the SNAP program. Because we have to focus on what programs are in place now that can actually help folks that many are not accessing. So some of those, just to give you a couple examples, are you know, recertification for older adults right now is typically two years. For many other populations, it's more like one year. It could even be six months. But since older adults are on a fixed income, we'd like to see that recertification be something more like three years, less paperwork. So a lot around streamlining the application process. The paperwork is a, This is, is a is big strong. reason that many people aren't enrolled. Because if you're, I, I've gone through this. If, if, you, if you're an elderly person, especially if you don't understand the language and things like that, a lot of people might say, I had a heck with it. I, I just can't do it. If you don't have a, a, a child to help you, it's, it's. Yes, it's, absolutely. Yes, so without why, an why is it why why is it done like that? Do they really not want people to go on it? No, it, there are many reasons why income has to be verified. Income versus expenses is very important in determining, determining eligibility. We can just kind of look to ways to make that a little bit easier, make that application process a little bit less intimidating. And that's really what we're doing as we work on the Long Island uh, Anti-Hunger Initiative together, is finding ways in the community to let older adults know where they can get help through this application as it is. But back to another recommendation. Yes. There are many ways that different state agencies can begin to work together to really pinpoint data that tells us exactly who is likely to be eligible, who is eligible, and not receiving the SNAP benefit. We can do that sort of direct outreach if we can get certain state systems and agencies to partner. So that's something that we're actively working yeah. on and really see as the best way to do the, the most effective outreach in terms of connecting those in need to SNAP. So just to pick up on Christine's points related to some of her recommendations, streamlining, and it's really not sort of the sexy advocate talk, you know, people don't want to hear about streamlining or, gover or government efficiencies or application efficiencies, but the reality is that needs to happen because if we can, for, for example, the recommendation that Christine gave about changing the recertification process, 
seniors' incomes, they're not changing. After a certain point in time when they're collecting Social Security or pension, if anything, it may decrease, um, but we're not, we don't see an increase with that population, and history shows us that. Data shows us that. So to streamline that would allow individuals to stay in the program, would, to your point about how confusing it is and how daunting it is sometimes to complete the application, would perhaps alleviate that because you only have to do it once for you know over a long period of time. And we work really hard with AARP and other members of the Long Island Anti-Hunger Task Force to get out in different ways and the Long Island Anti-Hunger Initiative to get out to individuals in the community in different ways to create trust and to help alleviate some of the barriers they may be feeling while we work on putting these recommendations in place. I was not part of that discussion. I wish I were. I do too. I, I have a recommendation. Great. Not, not, pick an age, 80, 85, whatever. Once they reach a certain age, that's it. They're recertified for life. Why do they have to go through it? What 85-year-old is suddenly going to make 500000 Right, right. Right. Well, this is, is this that, is our yeah, point. This is exactly is that a silly point. idea or not? No, this is exactly it's the common type of sense. stuff that we're pick an age. We're advocating 80, for 85, 90. Pick, you know, that's it. You don't have to go through it again. You have it. Absolutely, and there is there is data to show. You know, when we look at individuals that have been in the program that are in this age group, we can look at the fact that their income hasn't changed. Their residency hasn't changed. These are individuals, again, that may be in the same home that they've been in for the majority of their life, or maybe they've downsized and moved into an apartment. But again, it's they're staying put. They're not going anywhere any point, at any point in time soon. So these are reasons that, and we have, like I said, the data to really help push some of these recommendations through. And we need we need other folks to push this message as well. You know, this is we're sort of the, the usual suspects in pushing for these type of changes. But for community members that may want to get involved or be part of the conversation, you know, elected officials need to hear about this so that they can play their role in bringing that message to you know the appropriate departments, whether it be national or, or state, to, to get these changes put in place. Uh, to you mentioned elected officials of both parties, uh, I would like to give them a quote. I haven't heard this in 50 years, and it's too bad. Hubert Humphrey said, the test of any government is to help those in the shadows of life are needy, and in the twilight of life are elderly. Right. I don't hear people saying that anymore. That's right. And that is sad. Yeah, I think you know. when we, when we <laughs> see... End of editorial. You know, <laughs> with the facts that we've presented that, that really prove that so many older adults and many other populations are struggling on Long Island to even consider reining in a program that is proven to be the nation's first defense against poverty and hunger. It, it is hard to hear that, I think, for us because we know the effects that's going to have on so many people who rely on a program for their nutrition and ultimately it will affect their health if they don't have that. Solutions. Again, I'm going to quote from the Meals on Wheels article I mentioned last time. Hunger in America is a solvable problem through the collaboration of government, industry, nonprofits, and generous individuals, but we must do more. So how could government, both state and federal, outside government agencies, besides funding, which we all agree needs to be increased, that's no argument. Besides that, while we wait for that, and we may wait a long time, what do we do to get the agencies coordinated together to help with this problem? It's a, it's a really good question, and uh, that's a great article, and that's one of the reasons that we work together, is, is about collaboration and about recognizing that there's economies of scale and there's, we're able to leverage uh, more positive change for individuals when we do work collaboratively. And that's why you know, they point in the article about government, nonprofits, corporate, and individuals. We need to sort of shift the way in which we respond. And while government was very effective over the course of many decades with some of its anti-poverty programs, there has been a shift nationally in terms of how we spend money, how the government spends money. And I think to sort of keep our fingers crossed that, it, that government spending for these programs is going to increase dramatically, we would, we would be sitting here with our fingers crossed for a long time. What we do need to do is think innovatively about how we partner with corporations, foundations, philanthropic dollars, and government in a very different way so that there's shared responsibility, there's shared risk, 
and there's increased outcome for the individuals that we're serving as we know the numbers, quite frankly, are only gonna continue to increase in the very near future. So uh, uh, these philanthropists have helped and have they worked with this at all? Because I hear the uh, Clinton Global Initiative and Gates gives money for this and that. Have they helped with this at all or? Absolutely. I, or I've missed, I haven't, they don't emphasize it or what? No, our, this, uh, us, us sitting here today together is part of what you're talking about. It's an example of what you're talking about. We were lucky enough to apply for a grant that was a government grant, but that required matching dollars, <coughs> excuse me, from other entities. So what we were able to do is pull together a hundred, <coughs> excuse me, $150,000 from donors like AARP Foundation, United Way of Long Island, North Shore LIJ, Hunger Solutions, FRAC, and then draw down those government dollars to Long Island. So we doubled our money and were able to expand our collaboration and reach seniors that are eligible for the SNAP program to ensure that they get the benefits that they're eligible for. So if it wasn't for organizations like you, even though this is a serious problem, it would be far more serious. Indeed. Unfortunately. So you don't get you you guys don't get the credit you really should because you've helped alleviate problems that wouldn't have been. You know, I don't think either of us are looking for credit. No. We really take pride in, in the partnerships we're able to build and the impact that we can have in the community, and we're, we're always doing whatever we can. Um, I think another great example of the public-private partnerships that you're referring to that can really make a difference, and I think a, a key part of that is building overall awareness, is um, AARP Foundation has what's called the Drive to End Hunger. And that is another example of a huge partnership with Jeff Gordon and NASCAR and Hendricks Motorsports, wow. which is something that, though it may not resonate so much here on Long Island, is having a great impact around the country in letting people know that older adult hunger does exist. So I think thing, awareness building campaigns and, of course, revenue generating and, and you know funding people who are doing the best work in the community paired with some of the partnerships we have on the ground here on Long Island are really how we can continue to, to um, make a difference and move things forward. I get this in the mail and I contribute Long Island Cares, uh, Harry Chapin's organization. Mm -hmm. it went to my high school, by the way, left us much too soon. Yes. But yeah. um, things, organizations like that are a big help. Yes, they're a member organization of ours, along with Island Harvest and other organizations like the Long Island Council of Churches and the Inn are all playing a role, but I think what we can all agree upon is no one entity, government, a foundation, one organization, one corporation is gonna address this issue. And we need to think very differently about how we work together to address the issue that we know has grown to include now a, a new population, you know, the senior population in terms of those that are eligible and utilizing is greater than it's ever been in our nation's history. I wanna to get to two things now. I wanna involve our viewers because the first thing to do, to do something about a problem, you gotta know the problem exists. I think we've made it clear it does. So if a viewer here is watching the program and they, need, and they know someone who needs nutrition assistance, it could be a family, it could be their neighbor, it could be someone they met at the library, whatever, what can they do? Who do they contact? So uh, are there phone numbers or email addresses they could uh, inquire about that. Let's suppose it's a woman they met or a family member, what do they do first? So anyone struggling, we encourage to contact the Health and Welfare Council of Long Island. Um, they are a great point of contact for the Long Island Anti-Hunger Initiative. I'll give you a direct phone number. It's 516-505 4430 and I'll repeat that again. 516-505 Four four three zero. That's Gwen's organization. Yes, That's right. okay. and they'll speak with someone on our team. We have bilingual staff available to help individuals walk through the process, become educated about what the program is, what type of benefits may be available to them, how they go about applying for that, assist them with the application, how they go about utilizing those. So benefits. they can they come in. They can, we do a variety of different ways in terms of reaching individuals in the community. And, and a lot of what we do, again, is in partnership with AARP. We may be at an AARP event where we know that AARP has great name recognition, that individuals are gonna come for whatever type of event AARP may be holding, but perhaps they're not coming ready to talk about the fact that they're struggling to pay for nutritious foods. When they get there, they may talk with someone from my team at an event that's sponsored by AARP, so it brings credibility and trust to the conversation 
Suppose they are either homebound mm -hmm. or embarrassed or both, and they can't come to do the application. How could, how could the application be sent to them or what, what, what could they do? Well, we, we can reach individuals in any way they prefer that we reach them. So the first thing to do, as Christine said, is to call this number. Then there'll be a brief sort of pre-screening that will take place and an assessment to figure out what makes the most sense for the client based on the client's needs and whatever that they may be demonstrating. And this could be confidential? Absolutely confidential. Our information is not shared with anyone at all in terms of a phone call that's made. We never share that information. So the person himself or herself doesn't have to call? No. In other words, Mr. Jones could say, I know Mrs. Uh, Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. What do I do? And, and uh, they call this number. That's right. And they can actually, if someone is homebound, they can complete the application online. Oh. You don't have to come into an office to have that application completed. Um, if an individual maybe isn't so comfortable navigating the computer or going online, our staff can certainly work that with them either on the phone, talk them through how to do that, or meet them someplace where they may feel comfortable. If they don't want to meet at their home, we would set up an appointment at a library or another community center where the individual, again, felt comfortable. We want to do whatever we can to really help everyone access what they rightfully do in a way that makes sense for that individual. But that person eventually has to meet or, 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 or do the application. The person himself has to finally do it. No, no one no, can do it for them. It's actually changed now the way that the applications are required, that everything can be done online without talking, you know, going into any other office. Oftentimes, depending on the age of the individual or the income, there may be some questions, a follow-up call with income verification, but they, they can complete the application on their own. And what, and what time frame is this, and then I'll get to you. What time, once they do it, I mean, could they get an assistance within a week, a month, six months, what's the? Federal law requires that there would be a determination made if, if there aren't children in the household, the determination has to be made in 45 days. Okay. And if there's no children? No, I'm, if there are children, it's 30 days. If oh, there are okay. no children in the household, it's 45 so days. So 45 days, they would have a determination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry. And I was just going to mention there are emergency cases. If, some, if someone is truly in dire straits, there are ways to get emergency food and, and other immediate needs um, filled. And also, if a senior is struggling and unable to do the application on their own, they can designate someone to do that on their behalf. Um, it, 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 it's, it's fairly caregiver, easy. Right. Yeah, caregiver and, and other, another source. So if they have a health care um, proxy, that would have that would be enough? I would think so. There mm -hmm. might be another form you need, but absolutely, yeah, that can really help. Is there any other points uh, you want to make before we get to the next thing? Any other um, places they can go besides the council? Is there, that's the main one? Is there others they could? They could go to the Department of Social Services, uh, government office. Which I go like this because I've been there. Oh. Right, and I know that a lot of times individuals have you know, their own perceptions of going to government or the experience they may have had being there before, so they certainly could. Some of the people there are not very nice, I have to be honest. We have heard anecdotally from some of our clients that, it, that there are different points in times where it is a struggle. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, because the need is so great in our communities, both Nassau and Suffolk County, both of our departments of social services are very much overwhelmed yes. with processing a variety of applications, including SNAP. Yes. Okay, so those are the main areas they can go to. Yes, you yeah, want to and, and just by calling this, this number, 516-505-4430, our network is vast. So it's so possible you would, you would connect them to some other. Absolutely. Yes, wherever they prefer, wherever is most convenient. That's what we want to be able to help folks with. Okay. Again, our viewers, they're watching the program, hopefully, and they want to give back and help people with nutrition issues or are in poverty. How can they help? What so, organizations could they join, et cetera? So there are so many wonderful ways that, that one can give back when they want to impact this issue. Uh, I'll just speak to a couple that AARP Please. currently has going on, and I'll give out our phone number. Thanks. So AARP is always looking for volunteers for many different issues, and hunger is one of them. So just by calling 212-407-3745, and I'll repeat that, you can get involved with us on the ground here. Um, we actually have a new program we're working on. It's called Cooking Matters at the Store. It's a way of helping people on a budget navigate the grocery store in a way that's more cost effective. So someone that's really watching their every penny can find a better way to save money at the grocery store. It's a fun way to give grocery store tours and save money to be able to afford more nutritious foods. Um, there are other ways in terms of volunteering. We, we bring groups together. 
at food banks like Long Island Cares and Island Harvest and others, and pack food. So if you're more interested in that on the ground sort of work, you can do that too. And then I'll mention that if you are interested in giving money, that is the most impactful way so that a food bank can buy in bulk and use that purchasing power to get more. Um, and a great website to check out is drive2endhunger.org. That's drive2endhunger.org. And what was that phone number again before? And the volunteering phone number for AARP is 212-407-3745. Yes, I'm sorry, you had... No, I was just going to echo um, all the things that Christine said. Actually, we are the beneficiary of many AARP volunteers. So we have individuals that work with us on the LEA program, the Long Island Anti-Hunger Initiative, as Christine membered, m mentioned, and that has just expanded our capacity to really be able to reach individuals, follow up with individuals, create trusted relationships with individuals so again that they can access um, the supports that they should be accessing. But the other piece, while it's wonderful to volunteer with organizations, it's critical that they're supported from a philanthropic perspective. It's also really important for individuals to get engaged. You've mentioned government a number of times and we've talked about policies and programs and it really requires a movement of the community to ensure that we have the appropriate policies in place at the national, the state, and the local level to serve everyone, to the quote that you used, all individuals within our community, whether they're dealing with just a terribly difficult time or they've been in the shadows for an extended period of time, that we need individuals to be engaged and to vote. I've been in events where politicians are involved, regardless of party, and I've heard, I, they hear AARPs involved and they listen. So you do, you have had an effect. So when you uh, call a politician or you go to his office, the fact that it's AARP, I think they, they do listen. You do have an effect. And, and we value that responsibility that we have and hope that we can use our voice in the biggest way possible. And that's why I was so thrilled that we could start working on the issue of older adult hunger in 2010 because we know that our brand is recognized on a large scale. I think we're up there with American Express and we need to use that um, to move issues forward like hunger because it exists, it's there, and many people are unaware of it. So as much as we can do that, and we're really trying to do that across the nation with Drive to End Hunger. So if a, if, a, if a viewer wants to get involved with an organization, fine. It's not wrong for that viewer to call his local representative and say, you can't vote to cut these things. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, because they would, votes they listen to. Yeah, I mean, and, and consumers, individuals should inquire with their local representatives, you know, how do you feel about this issue? Did you know that so many older adults are struggling on Long Island? How do you combat that? How do you address that? What three things could we do or should be done that would help the most? I know, ta I know, it's I know time, it's is, I know time yeah. is short. I'll keep it fast. The public-private partnerships piece is huge. Wherever we can create new ones, we should. Strengthening the SNAP program is incredibly important. And lastly, awareness building. Again, through something like Drive to End Hunger, the more we can build awareness, the better this problem will be down the road. I would. I would say innovation, innovation, innovation. And what I mean by that is we need to regionalize many of our programs, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this from a local perspective, so we need to regionalize many of our programs and our supports, so breaking down the barriers, the jurisdictions that we have between villages and counties so that it's very easy to transfer and access the benefits that, you're, that rightfully do. The second piece is also the public-private partnership and being innovative and using capital in a very different way than we have previously. And the third piece would be an integration from a technology perspective and a data perspective is that we could have the roughly 50,000 eligible individuals on Long Island enrolled, perhaps if systems were a little bit different. Ladies, uh, you've convinced me. Anything I can do to help, uh, you'll have, uh, you have my support. Oh, that's great. Thank and you so much. I hope you have others too. Um, Christine, Gwen, thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having us. I want to thank my guests for a terrific discussion on this topic. I want my viewers to help in all ways possible to eliminate this, this insane disease from our society. I also want to thank the SUNY community at Old Westbury, Westbury for the beautiful studio. Thank Sherry Baker, the station manager, and her terrific crew. And until next time, this is Joe Haino wishing you a good night and a better tomorrow.